How many burger you believe in apartheid as a way of life? Yes, I do. Why? In South Africa. Why is that? Uh, because the race, which is in a lesser state of development, is by far in the majority here. And numerically, of course, they are much stronger. There was a state of emergency. You couldn't leave your house after 9 p.m. The police had the right to shoot you straight away without asking questions. Because the old National Party government were clever enough to learn from other people's mistakes, they studied the, the racism in every society. In 1948, in South Africa, a racist nationalist party was elected. It was the one instance of truly structured racial prejudice in the Western world. I had a brother who was in prison. I had a father who was in prison. Who the enemy was, was visible, tangible, and right there. I was often worried that I might actually end up in jail. What hope do we have when we have stones against their guns? Cape Town, 1972. A photographer, an actor, and a writer opened the Knott's venue to everyone. A move that stuck two fingers up at the segregation laws of the government. It was a space where everyone could speak their truth. It seemed an impossible ideal to find a space where we could say what we liked. The system said no mixing of races on stage, no mixing of races in the audience. We did it. We knew what we were doing. We were assaulting a system. We knew that the theater was powerful. We knew now we were using the word as a weapon for change. And by asleep to say we end the harvest. They took pot shots at absolutely every politician and every current affair going on. To be wished to die. People realize that what they are saying is happening to us. Things that were impossible for me, I saw, can be made possible. And I'm happy it still happened in my time, starting with the space. It's very, very hard, I think, for people who were not in South Africa in those years to understand quite what this system was. I mean, is there, you know, is there, are there many people now in America, for example, who remember what segregation was way back then? If you were white South African, you really didn't notice it very much. If you were black South African, it was part of your daily life. It was very challenging because uh, you had to get up in the morning, leave the comfort of your community to venture into a community that was made to be better than you whereas you didn't see it that way. Absolute stark divisions of black and white. You couldn't talk to a black person on the street without somebody coming to um, see what was going on. Throughout the 50s, 60s and 70s, the government implemented its twisted racial strategy known as apartheid. I was born into a racist society, went to a racist school, uh, went to a racist church because God was an Afrikaner, white Afrikaner. Um, and it was politically correct to be a racist in South Africa. It was a case of brutal oppression, keeping them down. All of this legislated for, these were laws that were passed. It was the one instance of truly structured racial prejudice in Western, in the Western world. 
On March 21st, the police station at the South African township of Sharpeville... In 1960, in a small township called Sharpeville, a peaceful demonstration turns violent and 69 protesters are shot and killed. It became known as the Sharpeville Massacre. Eyewitnesses said men, women and children fled... As early as the beginning of the 60s, the apartheid system had climbed on activities by black people, you know, and then so many people were sent to maximum security prisons because of political activities. I would say to my mother, my friends are dying, my friends are being tortured, my friends are disappearing. That was censorship. They watched us all the time. You just couldn't say and do as you please. Otherwise, you could land in big trouble. Finished in class. It was not a sort of monolithic, all-white-supported apartheid thing. There was a lot of people against it. Mixing was going on all the time underground in South Africa. I couldn't simply say each and every white person is, 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 is wrong. No, 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 no. I would stand for that. For, for instance, we even go to the ghettos with them. I mean, going to drink and socialize straight away, even during the riots. So we had no problem with that. I began to understand that there was another whole grouping of people who didn't accept the status quo. We had to actually start breaking the rules in order to make sense of what was sort of hopefully a place to move towards. There were a lot of people already in the space mood, let me put it that way, wanting something to happen, wanting something to change, but um, nobody knew how. And into this cultural and political maelstrom stepped naive country boy Brian Astbury. In 1960, Brian gets a holiday job in the Cape Times Library. It is here that he meets the actress, anti-apartheid campaigner, journalist, and newspaper librarian Yvonne Bryslin. Yvonne changed my life around completely. You know, from a, a very small town, very naive young boy. You know, suddenly here I was with this woman who was 16 years older than I was, I had three children. And I'm introduced into a whole situation where I'm suddenly, I learn about homosexuality, I learn about black-white relationships. I then got thrown in at the deep end of apartheid in Cape Town. Right from early on, you know, we'd, I'd go to parties with Yvonne and we'd see all kinds of amazing people. And then Athol came into our lives. Athol Fugard was a charismatic young writer, director, and actor who had already gained a reputation for his open rejection of the apartheid regime. In 1967, Yvonne Breslin would interview Athol, and that interview became the start of a lifelong creative partnership. You get sort of marriages in theatre, <laughs> they spiritual marriages, and Yvonne and Athel were a marriage made in heaven. They fed off each other, and she contributed enormously to his writing, there's no question. I mean, the two of us were a creative team that um, I've never had again in my life. To be on stage with her is one of my most cherished, cherished memories. Athol particularly had a group of people, artists, writers, poets. A lot of actors started coming in and then the parties sort of, in our terms, started getting closer around theatre. In tightly controlled South Africa, there wasn't a space where the artists could stage their work. Work that openly explored the government's racial segregation policies. There was no freedom of speech. There were certain books and plays and stuff that we were forbidden to read. So as a young thinking and enthusiastic person, you just wanted to break all those things down. 
So obviously the country was ripe for change at every level. And it was this constant attack on your dignity as a human being, you know, constantly your dignity was being attacked. And somehow you had to find a way in here and in here to build a wall. The increased levels of government violence towards the non-white majority marked the end of peaceful resistance in South Africa. And on the 24th of July, 1964, something happened that would shake white South Africa to its core. John Harris, the white school teacher and father of one, angry at the apartheid laws, planted the bomb on the concourse of the Johannesburg train station. He called the police, warning them to clear the station to avoid human casualties. When the police failed to clear the platform, the bomb went off, killing one and injuring 23. And John Harris, who was caught uh, as the man who'd done that, was tried and he was hanged. For me, it was an incredibly provocative moment in South Africa's history because that was, in a sense, a voice from white South Africa about the injustice that was prevalent in the whole country under apartheid. The brutality of that system, the evil of that system, and John's bomb was the, the voice of outrage. Inspired by the growing political unrest and the John Harris bomb, Athel decided to work on a play that would explore the motives of a terrorist. And so he took Yvonne, he took Val Donald and Wilson Dunst, the three actors, that's all. And he took them into a little rehearsal room above um, the lobby of theatre uh, in Cape Town, and they vanished in there. This isn't at all as what it was, how I remembered it. It was an absolutely bare room, bare floor. Ah, Athol moved in here. They stayed here for 10 weeks rehearsing. My mandate as I went into that rehearsal room was the image of John Harris in the Johannesburg Railway Station with a case on a bench and in it, dynamite and a timer. Athol chose to depict the story of John Harris using the Greek myth Orestes. The story of Orestes is that of a troubled young man who avenges the death of his father, Agamemnon, by killing his mother, Clytemnestra. Fugard would spend hours setting up an improvisation. He would write down what we gave him that he thought was of any significance in terms of the project. I couldn't believe how good he was. I have never seen any director work at the depth and with the intensity that Athol did. He just opened up a world for me. Uh, that was quite extraordinary. It was almost as if I hadn't properly been born as an actor. But the subject matter that Athol and his cast were exploring was dangerous. It was very obvious that Wilson stood for John Harris. There was a point where there was a man parked outside my apartment and he, I, I, I started to greet him after a while. He was watching me. What came out of that rehearsal room was a piece of experimental theater, the likes of which South Africa had not seen. It was just over an hour long, with virtually no set except for seven chairs, a matchbox, and a suitcase. There was no way to accommodate that sort of theater in the establishment, that the establishment could not really deal with it. 
Ostracized by the state-funded theaters, Ethel and his cast were relegated to a community home not normally used for theater. But even here, the play would have a transformative impact on those who saw it. You came out of it shaken. People always came out of it really shaken. This is the sort of theater that we want to do. This is important theater, but we need a space to do it. The effect of this play on Brian was profound. I'll say it quite clearly, Orestes changed my life. Brian, who was married to Yvonne Bryson, who was in the play and was working very closely with Athol, burned to find a place where this sort of exciting experimental work could be done. It had been a dream long before that, but, but now it, it seemed as though it was necessary. I was aware of a whole bunch of actors and directors sitting around saying, we wish we had a theater. And one of the major things that started coming to me out of that was, if something has got to be done, do it. Brian started looking for a venue where writers, directors, and actors could express their views clearly through their work. Brian took me around a few places looking at premises for theater. We'd walk up and down, we'd look at buildings, knock on the door. He took me to a horrible place in Bloom Street owned by Raymond Seba. It used to be the plating works. He said, what do you think of this? I said, I think it's terrible. He says, tough, he says, I've taken it. Uh, <laughs> it was very typical of Brian. The place was utterly filthy. Nobody had tried to clean it. And Yvonne started seeing with horror that I actually meant to do this because she knew I was heading into, you know, a world of pain. He stuck his neck out. It was a foolish thing to do. I mean, in, in retrospect, I mean, it, it, it appears it wasn't. It was brilliant. I said, right, when are we going to start on the thing? And Brian said, well, I haven't got enough money. I'll have to wait. Fundraising events were staged, and it was during a private event outside Cape Town in early 1972 that a young black poet, Fatima D.K., performed in front of an all-white audience, something that was unheard of. I remember the first uh, thing that we ever did was the fundraising concert at, in Constantia where I was uh, doing the, the Black Poets. Sue Clark had this friend, Fats, that I'd sort of just met. We had poetry readings and various things together. And then when they did that at the, at the Barn Theatre, they had that amazing evening. Fats did Barney Simon's Madam Please, and she... She was an absolute hit. Madam, please, before you shout about your broken plate, ask about the meal her family ate. This, to me, was a piece of protest poetry, which would tell all the white madams who would be at that event what it's all about being a maid. Before you laugh at the watchman's English, Try to answer in his Zulu language. It was like electricity in the atmosphere. And she was just a performer connecting to a text and a passion, a real passion in her heart. Before you say that the driver stinks, come, take a bath in a sewer to sink. There was such silence in the audience that uh, I don't think people had, had ever heard anything spoken publicly like that. Um, ever. Madam, please, before you say that last Saturday's funeral was a lie, ask me how my people died. An audience that had come for a completely different reason. Suddenly this complete unknown to them steps in and her passion just wiped everybody out. And to a certain extent, that was a moment that set the space on the road. Ask now what we want. Ask now how we live. Ask now if we dream. Ask now, madam, please. In 
late November, uh, early December. Yvonne was sitting there obviously thinking, oh my God, you know, he's going to end up with egg all over his face if there's nothing in there. And she started talking to Athel and then he came back a week later, phoned her and said, okay, I'll write a play. You know, we had a lot of people already in support, but suddenly it just took off. People just used to come up, knock on the door and say, you know, can I help? Actors were building and painting. My mother was in there with her broom and my daughter came with all her friends. Everybody was clearing things out. There were all these white people, you know, busy working. So you can imagine the impact of it on me. I had no idea what the theater looked like. I came from the township. There was a warehouse. I had no idea what it was gonna look like until the main theater was standing. And as I stood there, I felt, wow. On March 25th, 1972, the Space Theater opened its doors to everyone. When the space came along in Cape Town, um, for us as like young actors just out of our teens, the excitement was, was enormous. There was a great surge of energy in Cape Town and that's why the space attracted so many people who came and, and gave them of themselves and of their talents in a way that um, that just couldn't be stopped because here was an opportunity to actually speak out and I think we were desperate. This was a, a pursuit, this was an ambition and it was actually happening. While the old factory was being converted into a theater, Athol and his cast were busy devising a new play for the opening. With the opening night fast approaching, Brian needed a title. One day, Yvonne and Athol appeared in my office, and the two of them appeared looking at me sort of slightly from one side. <laughs> said, yes, said Athol, we have a title. Statements after an arrest under the Immorality Act. What are you frightened of? Everything. Me, you, them. A very big case had happened with a, a white librarian in a country town in South Africa. Had had an affair with a coloured headmaster of the local school. Having an affair with a white man as a black person, it was a crime in South Africa. It was Immorality Act. The Immorality Act was an iniquitous piece of apartheid legislation and lay at the heart of the government's racial policies. Thousands were charged under the act, forcing mixed-race couples into hiding. I'm proud! Proud! Oh, I teach children how to spell that word, yeah. I say to them, proud as a peacock. Opening with a play that challenged the government's Immorality Act, while also ignoring the segregation laws of the country, made it very unlikely that the space would last more than one night. Ooh, you know, that was more or less like saying, come and close us down. Me? Holding my breath and sweating, really sweating, man. Because suddenly we heard something and I thought, they found us, run! I was in statements after an arrest under the Morality Act, and very often on that stage at night, plenty of time to hear the police sirens approaching the theatre and thinking, if they stop, I'm, I'm, I'm probably going to be arrested, and we all will be. I was distressed by it, obviously I was distressed, but it was a, almost a clinical dissection of the dilemma that people who because they fell in love, fell into this trap. I can see, I can taste, I can feel, I can smell, I can hear. I can't 
love. That play really sparked off the outrage. What for me it said to people was, look and wake up. This is literally murder, more than character murder, you're murdering love. Statements was the first play, but the pressure never let up. One night I was driving Yvonne home after the performance, <laughs> and she said, what are we going to do next? I thought, next? Next? There's a next? <laughs> and suddenly I felt as though I was in this huge great tunnel. <laughs> There was a light coming towards me with a very loud sound of a train. <laughs> God, <sighs> I'd forgotten that there was a next. <laughs> I had to go into this enormous forward thing. Wow, put your foot on the brain. We've got to find something. But fortunately for us, Donald Howarth, who'd met um, Ethel and Yvonne in London, a playwright, he decided to come to South Africa. He had done an adaptation of Othello Slech's Blancas, Whites Only. It was an apartheid society, so you couldn't perform it here, so I'll have to write it without Othello. And uh, that's what I started to do. He wasn't prepared to have a white actor to put on a black makeup to do Othello. So we watched that, and we thought, this guy's crazy, eh? bloody Englishman. But it's okay, because he's talking, not politics, but he's talking human rights. Donald Howell's next play, Scarborough, would forcibly remind everyone of the tight censorship restrictions imposed on the people of South Africa. It would be the first of many clashes the space would have with the censor board was disturbing to know that one was actually being observed so closely as, as we all were at the time. I think the very nature of the theatre is that it is provocative and challenging the status quo. So we knew that it was being monitored or watched or whatever you call it. The authorities were lurking. They could pounce at any moment. Policemen would walk into the theatre and everybody would like, Hold their breath. Maybe today is the last night. What's going to happen next? You know, maybe tomorrow there'll be 10 vans and they load everybody up and take us away, you know? But you can't stop because that would make them win. And, and so there was never a sense. I mean, I think we were young and foolish. <laughs> You know, if my children were to be in that kind of situation today, I'd say, oh, please don't, please, you'd never know what's going to happen. We knew it was dangerous and it was a careless love because we cared, if that makes sense. We always seem to rise up and put something on, get something together. You know, whether it's turning to a Peter Dirk Ace and saying, Peter, there must be a script in your drawer, we're going to do it in a week. We can't afford to be dark for longer than a week. To be or not to be in Namibia, that is the question. <laughs> Whether it is noble in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of international outrage or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing them end them, to die, to sleep, no it, no way. We had to do everything. When a new play comes, we had to go and build that set. We would pull the set of the old play down on Saturday night, okay? Work right through the night. All of us had to work very hard. Rehearsals and help ushering and cleaning up the place and painting the place and whatever, you know. After statements after an arrest under the Immorality Act, Athol went back to his all-black drama group, the Serpent Players, who had a reputation for challenging the apartheid laws and taboos of the country. 
I knew certain players. They were an amazing group of actors. I mean, they'd worked with Athol for about six years. Um, and they were incredible, and he was incredible. It was a fantastic group of actors. Athol was exciting. He wanted the gut out of you. He pushed you until you felt, I don't like this white man because he wanted to deal with your anger. What he was doing, he was merging the African structure of the storytelling with the Western concept of theater. And this theater that he was bringing to merge with my African storytelling was giving me a bigger audience than just a few people around the fire. And what says to it that you remain in your beautiful suburbs reserved for whites only? The law! The authorities were intent on stifling any form of creative expression within the non-white community, heavily censoring scripts and imposing tight restrictions. The pressure from the police was automatic. The nature of the plays, the work we were doing, touching on social issues, political issues, which is an area which was taboo. You were also harassed by the special branch because they felt that what we were doing was to uh, rebel against the regime. Members of our caste would be incarcerated. So it made us real rebellious. Then Arthur said, a friend of his have opened a little space in Cape Town. Well, people can privately, if they want it, bring something. We looked at each other and we thought, let's go check this out. This is an opportunity we have been looking forward to, where we would have the liberty to put our works on display. So we did this play for one night. Just a walking stick. It's just a fashion statement. What an evening. It was absolutely jam-packed, and they were amazing. I mean, they were just such an incredible group. The pace went like boom, and God, Arthur was so excited. He was so excited. We were all excited because we're not just talking to the black people, we're talking to an integrated audience, people who also felt it. People had never seen such uh, energy and um, such um, sort of blatant political work. Serpent players were an amateur group. There was little or no chance of earning a living as black actors in South Africa. But the experience of the space had turned Don Carney and Winston Shona onto the possibility of doing just that. So I spoke to John and I said, then why don't we try theater full time? Because what was paramount was to fill that void left by the people who had been sent inside. That was the score that the Serpent Players was settling. Can someone tell me why they're fighting in the Middle East? <laughs> I mean, somehow, they've been fighting for such a long time. Someone must just stop and say, whoa, why are we fighting? <laughs> I know what really vices me. They look the same. <laughs> we're desperate. We not only needed to survive literary, but needed to make a statement and become professional artists in this field. I'm tired of being another man's boy. We said to Athol, can you help? We believed that there was something we could create ourselves. So John, Athol, and Winston began devising a new play. And true to form, they didn't shy away from controversy, basing their play on one of the key components of the segregation laws of South Africa, the passbook. The passbook being that odious document, ID document, that every African adult was forced to carry by law. Inside each passbook, there was a code. If you are born in the Western Cape, your code could be 10.1. If you are born in Port Elizabeth, your, your code could be 10.2. 
burn this number in your head, my brother. This is more important than your name. The white man will never ask for your name. He will always ask for this number. The excuse was, we want to contain our blacks in Port Elizabeth because there are only enough jobs for them. So when people come from other towns, they bring in thieves and criminals. If a policeman stops you on the street and says, please, I want to see your passport, he looks for the code. It was just evil because now white had to carry it. And it was just these two characters stumbling over a dead man in an alleyway who had a passbook. And then the idea, which many tried in South Africa, of taking that little picture out of one passbook and pasting it carefully into the other passbook. Look, uh, uh, this is a chance. Uh, uh, this is your only chance. And um, Arthur apparently had told Yvonne Bryce and, and, and uh, Brian Osprey there's a little production that uh, John, Arthur and myself were, were doing and would be interested to just showcase it at this space. I sort of worked out with my really basic accounting, you know, that if we gave all the money from the bonds to them, uh, we could actually get them what the salary they were earning in these, you know, not very well-paying jobs, but we could more or less match that. Now we had to perform it somewhere before Cape Town. Arthur organized the neighbors around Schoonmaker's Corp, including the, uh, the helpers, the maids and the servants and the gardeners. Let us sing, because Jacob is a better man. Jacob hasn't got our troubles. Jacob hasn't got our problems because Jacob at last has reached home. That's a home for a black man, my brother. It's when they dig a hole six feet deep in the ground to bury us. It's when they press our faces against the cold earth and we smile with our teeth out. That's the only time we'll be happy, my brother, is when we are dead. Some of the black elderly ladies walked out in tears. They said, you are playing with the pain of our people. This past thing is not something to play with. I'm worried about you, John and Winston. You're going to be arrested. This police force is ruthless. They killed my brother, said Emily, an old lady 62. So, we set a date, September the 10th, 1972. And they wanted to know, what was it? What do you call it? We didn't have a name for it. So I said, what is it? It's got a name? No, it doesn't got a name. But by the time we got, got here, uh, we had a title. Susa Banzi is dead. Susa meaning the nation, Banzi meaning big, broad. At least you can do something for your family. How do I live as another man's ghost? Ghost? Wasn't Sizwe a ghost? I was at the first performance of Sizwe Bunzi at the space, and it was capacity. People didn't believe that something that amazing, that powerful, had happened in front of them. You went to see black people on stage being great. The moment that stands out to me in Sizwe Bunzi is when he talks about his identity and how he's had to take on another identity just to, to belong. Am I not a human being? I've got a wife and four children. And I think that, that in our society, it happens so often is that we just are not allowed to be who we are. Take your name back if it means that much to you. But next time, next time that white man calls you John, don't say yes sir, it's not your name. Next time that fucking white man calls you a boy, don't run up to him and say, yeah, boss. Tell him, white man, I'm a man, not a boy. Watching those kind of plays was scary. Scary in the sense that you don't know if the special branch is in. You just don't know who you're sitting with. We, of course, had a visit from the special branch threatening to close down the show because we were violating the Group Areas Act. Brian got legal advice, and if it was a private performance for an invited audience, we were safe. 
And that's all we had to do, make sure that everybody had an invitation. Make everybody a member. On the night, there could be no, no fault in the, attached to the space. Over the next week, of, I think it was eight days, they signed up 3,000 members. <laughs> we played to packed houses. And suddenly we had this huge club. And so the run went ahead. Taunting the law and using a very simple system. This is, this is a battle. This is a battle and we're going to use all sorts of weapons in this battle. We're going to do this irrespective of, of what the system dictates and we will find a loophole. It heartened me. It gave me the, the encouragement and, and um, confidence to know that as a young actor of colour in South Africa, the possibilities were enormous. Then, of course, um, we got the invitation to, from the Royal Court Theatre to bring Sir Zabanzi is dead. Now, Athol didn't have a passport because it was denied long ago. So we all three applied. But the chances of the authorities allowing these three men to present a play overseas that highlighted the racism prevalent in the country were slim. However, John and Winston were not going to sit and wait. Instead, they began working with Athol on a new play. And then we chose a special place, which was taboo to talk about Robin Island. But unfortunately, we stood no chance of naming it Robin Island, so rather we called it an island, a fictitious island, but it was Robin Island. It looks so beautiful when I saw it the first time surrounded by the mist. Hey, Winston, ah. you said beautiful words that day. Remember? When they tipped us over here, you picked me up from the sand and you looked back and you said, farewell, Africa. The genesis of the island has a very, very different story to that of Sisuwe Bonzi. Our Serpent Players group in Port Elizabeth was targeted by the special branch at a certain point. It ended up with them actually arresting members of our drama group, and they were sentenced for varying periods to imprisonment on Robben Island. And in fact, this whole structure of the island is based on the experience of one of the actors. The actor, Shark Mukuku, he disappeared. We searched for him and his wife came and told us Shaq has been arrested. He was tried in Credoc, away from Port Elizabeth, and he was sentenced to seven years. He is on Robben Island. We were doing a production of Antigone, very pertinent to South Africa. He was so furious at having lost his chance to be on stage in this play that meant so much to him because it was about freedom of speech, freedom to act, freedom to bury your kin. Despite being incarcerated, Shaq acted out a one-man version of Antigone for fellow inmates. Rumor has it that Nelson Mandela saw that performance. That's clicked the idea. <gasps> Shaq, these two prisoners prepare a performance of an extract from Antigone for the prison concert. So, Antigone represents exactly what these men's lives were about, a fight with and against the system. You are told not to, not to bury your brother. Your brother is a traitor. How can you go out and go and bury your brother? That's against the state law. But he's my brother. That, that, that theme, it comes through. The willing is to die for what you believe. Still waiting. No news about my passport. Arthur said, I've spoken to Yvonne. They can give us a, 
a week at the Space Theatre. But then they arrived with this play and it just told you everything that you needed to know about being incarcerated on the island. And there were always things that, that Fugard particularly could bring and could, could shake you with to make you think. Why am I here? No. Why am I here? You put your head on the block for others. Fuck others. Don't talk like that. Fuck others. Those plays were just incredible and I, and I don't believe they could have been done at any other place at that time. I want to count. God also gave me ten fingers. But what do I count inside here? My life. How do I do it? How do I do it? One. There was an act of witnessing. There was no room for conceit in it or for vanity or for backslapping and say we've done a good job. We were actually just trying to bear witness to something that was happening at that very moment on an island offshore. Another day comes, one. The theatre at that time sort of helped some of us, especially youngsters, sort of helped us open our eyes because we didn't get in our newspapers. Brothers and sisters of the land, I go now on my last journey to the island, strange and cold to be lost between life and death forever. So to my grave, my everlasting prison, condemned alive to solitary death. Come out of prison. Time waits no longer. I go now to my living death because I honor those things to which honor belongs. While doing that, my passport arrived. So now, we were going to England. And we came over, and it was hugely exciting. Full chock a block, standing ovation, most vibrant audience, as vibrant as the audience is in South Africa. And then after that, we did an extensive tour of Great Britain. We had a great sense of celebration. I mean, we had superstars. Once we had got the work overseas, which then involved them moving to Broadway, you know, to New York, onto a Broadway stage, which ended up with John and Winston getting Tony Awards. The nominations for Best Actor are John Kenai, Winston and Shona, Anthony Hopkins, Peter Firth, Ben Gazzara for blah, 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 blah. And the winner is this. The winners are John <laughs> And Arthur says, he won. You got it, guys. Both of you. You got it. Go, go. There was no speech. We had the performance that afternoon. A matinee at three. So as we walk, we speak in Corsa. What are we going to say? And we say, we'll say thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. John and myself picked up the, the Tony as the best actors in, on Broadway. The New York Times in the morning says their silence was the most potent statement against the inhumanity of the illegitimate apartheid government of South Africa. They are silence. Now we didn't have anything to say. It went on and on and on and on. They were the Sputnik, Apollo, the moon landing of what the space did internationally. And they sealed its reputation. It was unbelievable. I mean, we were not doing shows to pick up awards or, you know, to put anything on display other than we were doing works to inform the world about the atrocities of the, of the system at the home. The space gave them the first opportunity to flex their muscles. The space gave them the first opportunity for the word about the work to filter out. Many, many, many people in, in London and in New York and in Europe uh, and in Japan and all over the world, they have an interest in South Africa because of those space plays that they saw right there. Our nation cannot reconcile its commitment to human rights 
and labor rights with its partnership with South Africa. When it really blew out like that, very exciting for me as a young black woman. Very, very exciting. It actually said, you're doing the right thing. 1975, we finished after about six months on Broadway. Come back to South Africa, and we're now on stage in Butterworth in a town hall. And for the first time, white people forced themselves into the hall. Black people forced themselves, which means by virtue of a mixed audience, we'd already broken the law. And during the play, I see armed white policemen with the guns closing every exit. So I thought, oh, here we go again. At the end of the play, in costume, as I bow, they grab me from the stage and grab Winston. The people move in to try and protect us. They pull out their guns. There were two cars. Winston is bundled in the other car. I'm put in another car, this side in the middle, with two white policemen and one in front and one black. I could feel the nozzle of the gun on my ribs. We'd driven 80 kilometers out of this town. We pulled the car aside. The guy in front goes out, talks to the other one, and the other one said, bring him out, kill him. There was never a moment so peaceful in my life when he said, shoot him, shoot him. I was at peace. I thought, what a good day to die. I just hope my family would know that I died for something I believed in. I realized on the road, there was an accident. <laughs> the truck had smashed the hind legs of the horse and they pull it, they're trying to pull it out. It wasn't kill him, it was kill it. <laughs> John and Winston were detained indefinitely, accused of being enemies of the state. A word of their arrest got out. In London, you know, all sorts of people, Janet Sussman and a whole group of people came out on the streets and marched to the South African embassy demanding their release. On the 15th day, a piece of paper shakes under the cell door. It was an article. Trafalgar Square, on a rainy day, it's Janet Sussman, Albert Finney, Ben Kingsley, Vanessa Redgrave, and Robert Morley with an umbrella. They all had these little placards, free John Gunny, free Winston Jonah. I knew. They cannot kill me now. They were prepared to be hauled in front of the police, prepared to be arrested, prepared to sacrifice their lives for this, the art. One thing I became aware of at that time was if I was black, I would be dead. I remember rushed meetings and quick meetings. Oh, come, Moira, there are somebody in the room and they say, oh, no, the board or something, or the center board was here, or someone's coming, or there's something going down. It was those kind of things. We were all sort of, wait, wait. Oh, is this when we lose our home? Is this when it all, you know, ends for us? The seriousness um, of, of the possibility of being arrested or whatever um, certainly hung around. It was also the fight to survive against government and censors and fear. Lots of fear out there. 1971, 72, 73, 74. Um, and yet we just did it. We knew we were engaged in one endeavour. And that endeavor wasn't just political, it wasn't just to say things. It affected you, you know, it took you with you, you know. You wanted to be part of that energy. You wanted to be part of that, God, creativeness. And therefore the space was for me the most courageous artistic space. It was never afraid, it was never afraid. That's, that's why we could have plays banned and reply to those bannings you know, in another play. <laughs> yeah, we were easily the most banned theatre in South Africa. I mean, it was very tough when plays got banned. It was there to crush our spirit, really. It was there to maybe close the theatre down, to put us in our place. You can never stop the artists, you can never stop writers, you can't stop, stop free expression. 
And that, that was a big fight because it was a very difficult time. We always, from the beginning, wanted to do good theatre. We wanted to do theatre that was tough and had a, a, some sort of message. And so we were choosing plays, you know, The Geese, which came in quite late. It was an amazing play and it seemed to be about us. The brutality of a police state is, is what the play was about. It was the ultimate censorship. Leslie Udwin was playing a pregnant woman and she was garroted and baby torn out of her on stage. Um, I'd never seen anything like that. It lasted exactly two days and was banned. In comparison to what is going on in our country, you would say, well, that's pure madness. A piece of theatre that speaks the truth about a, a police state is banned because it's speaking the truth. I've had bannings all the time. Yeah, for the first 10 minutes, you think, oh, it's my baby. And then you think, stop it. Pick yourself up, dust yourself up, and do it again. Why so many white South African men have skew mouths? And they actually found out that so many white South African men have skew mouths because when they go through the kitchen, they say to the maid, see you in the garage. I mean, Peter Doug surely took the mickey out of people. He hit very hard at the government, but it was always so much fun that they didn't they put him in jail for it. They tried. There was always somebody in the enemy camp who seemed to be on my side. Somebody who said, check the tires. What? Click. What does that mean, check the tires? I check my tires and then they would taken the hubcaps off and taken the screws off the wheels so the wheel would have come off if I had gone. When the sensors closed us down, it was terrifying, it was horrible, but we never felt like losers. And I think that was the spirit of survival. And that was Brian, who's never, ever allowed us to become the victims. We were never the victims. It was kind of Brian was looking after us all. He kind of made sure we were safe-ish. He never turned people away. Everybody who came in through that door had to come in through that door, prove themselves or fail. To me, that was the beauty. There was no rejection. That was the beauty. It's all about a belief in the possible. You know, you, you've just got to know that the impossible is possible. With the rent increasing on the original building, a new premises had to be found. The space found a disused YMCA building on Long Street. The designs for the theater were drawn up by architect Maciek Mischewski, who had also designed the original theater. And the building work began. The Space Club collected a whole bunch of funds and we converted that into this new venue for ourselves. It was in a beautiful Victorian building that had wrought iron metal uh, balconies and it was on three or four floors. Just got a lovely calm feeling when you walked in. People were always leaving stuff on the bloody stairs. Actors would just walk straight past the damn thing, you know, without picking them up. It used to really cheese me off. And then you went into the theatre and walked across the stage to where the audience were on three sides. So it felt very intimate. It's a, a hell of a lot posher than we ever had. We didn't have any red plush. We just had our old plastic seats that Raymond Seber sold us in 1972, which lasted till the end of time. It felt like theatre in the raw, really, that you'd come there for the play and the ideas and be close proximity to the actors, which was exhilarating. It really took off. And we were doing a lot of plays. And at that stage, I'd say that, you know, probably at least 60% of the company of actors who worked there were black. Most of the black people who came to the space came through Fatima Dike. She was very influential to all of us. <laughs> And she invited quite a number of people from Langa, where she lives. Some of them had never been on stage. 
she created a village of actors. Fats was hanging around all the time and we took her on as a stage manager. We wanted her to learn about theatre and she wanted to learn and she did. And then she just hung around and started writing these amazing bloody plays. To me the space became a university because I never went to university. I was seeing plays from all over the world so I was learning on the job. To the people in the townships, there was a relationship to the space where we all sit together as South Africans and we watch the best theatre in the country. That exciting effect of people of different colour sitting in the auditorium and watching a play and reacting and clapping and, you know, ululating and that kind of atmosphere kept me in theatre. I came from a community that did not have a voice. And the stage for me was giving me that opportunity to tell my people's stories. If you saw a white face in the audience and there was a passage in the play that related to racism or the suppression of people, you would choose that white person and you would talk directly to them about what their government was doing. You know, it nurtured attitudes and minds and, and the, the getting together of people in the most extraordinary, valuable, fundamental way. It was easy to mix with each other, eat with each other, talk to each other like brothers and sisters. Then one could see that there is, there is hope. You so see people crying, you see them because I'm talking right directly to them. I mean, that's what theater does. That's what, that's that itch. You want to talk to your people. Can you imagine being given the freedom to speak to an audience of white people, colored people, black people, but mostly white people, and vent your feelings? Can, can you imagine that? You have no idea. So, in a way, the space was asking me to live then what I thought should be for the whole South Africa, but it wasn't really. Uh, so the, the reality would always hit me. It would always hit me. Seventy-six had arrived, and uh, and terrible things. It's when the Soweto riots took place, and the children took the future of of the country in their hands. The students took to the streets, and the main issue was: we are not going to study the language of the oppressor. So you've got no respect for our language, no respect for our culture. We can't even vote in our country of our birth. So to hell with you guys. There were tanks in the street with water guns and all that kind of stuff, so it felt like something out of a movie that was you know, happening all around. On the 11th of August in 1976, when I saw the first black child in Cape Town being shot dead by policemen, there was a young child from Langa High School who was protesting, and I had to go straight to work immediately after that for my two o'clock shift because we were putting up a set. Fats came in and, you know, instead of this ebullient bundle of joy that used to come in every day, laughing and you could hear her coming a mile off, this quiet, gray woman walked in and she didn't look in my eyes. All my white friends from the theater, people who made me feel safe, people who showed me that not all white people were evil. And that day when I walked into the theater and I just experienced the death of this black child, they were my enemies. And she said, I've come to tell you that I hate you. I hate you. 
And if I hadn't come in here today, I would never have come inside this theatre again. And she turned and walked away. My reasoning factor came back to me and said, you can't take it out on them. But then again, who, who, who am I to take it out on? Because if I take it out on the system, the system is not going to think twice, it's going to kill me. So it, it was that living that way on a daily basis. It was never the same. We had a different way of looking at the police. We tended to be suspicious of each other. You never knew who who's speaking to the special branch, who's speaking to the police, and who's, you know, there was so much tension happening at the time. Fear was huge because the government was using every aspect of that uprising to frighten white people into supporting them. I remember nights when the theater was buzzing. And then I also remember nights when it was empty and it was heartbreaking and you, you didn't perform tonight because there were two people in the audience. Or you performed because there were two people in the audience and you said, these two people dared to come out. When you analyze theater, it's just nonsense. You, how can it win? I mean, you've got to get people to go. And today you've got to get them to put on their burglar alarms, load their guns, feed their Rottweilers, drive to the theater, kiss their car goodbye, and, and then you bore them and they'll never come back. So we always have to really be better than that last meal. So we learned how to fight back, fight back, with humor. Yeah, my old granny loved it till she was old, no? And then she was told to move. Group areas act. Yeah, I'm sure you've heard of it. We've got to do that in a way that will hide what we're doing, but nonetheless make them listen to it. I can't help but hate. Just a little. <laughs> if he didn't laugh, he would do the other thing, get angry, hit somebody and we'll never see you again. Because once they take you away, who knows? The, the tactics that were being used was, was, was great in the sense that um, uh, you were able to say things you wouldn't necessarily be able to say off stage. And you were sending out messages that you felt South Africa needed to hear. Now, this honorable minister of bugger all, the space continued staging its controversial work. But with rising costs, the advent of television, and civil unrest in the streets, they were struggling. Money was draining out, and we were having real, a real tough struggle surviving. Honestly, I didn't even realize that the space was in financial trouble at all, because there was so much going on. The first leaving was Yvonne, of course, when she got a contract at the National Theatre. That was a fantastic moment for her to expand her career outside of South Africa. And once she was there, I think it was very tough and maybe it was one to two years where they were living separately and Brian stuck it out of the space. You know, when you're operating without subsidy and you have a whole big theatre that you have to pay the rental and the actors and this and, and that, and money has to come in. Running a, a, a theatre like The Space, um, wounds a lot of people. Brian was doing great work at the space, but there was no funding coming forth. The funds were given to the state-run uh, theatres. So that was another frustrating thing for Brian. I mean, he had to take that decision. It was tough and hard um, decisions had to be made. It was just like working in a pressure cooker. We had these massive blow-ups and Peter exploded and left. But it was the result of 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 12 months a year, constant, 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 constant adrenaline poisoning. I think of Brian and I think of the, of him battling. I was reaching really tiredness and advanced depression about South Africa. It was a very turbulent time. Police coming up Long Street outside us, just throwing tear gas. We weren't facing water cannon or having to show pass books or the other indignities that people have to live with on a daily basis. One day, somebody said, we're just a bunch of middle-class white wankers. You know, and, and it felt that way. 
we were sitting around saying, you know, what we've done has been useless. You know, it didn't work. We tried. It didn't go anywhere. <sighs> because of the political struggle, a lot of 15, 16, 17 year olds in the middle of their schooling career left South Africa to join the guerrilla forces. During the Soweto riots, hundreds were killed. As the security forces tried to regain control of the townships, many now saw violence as their only option. It was a very confusing time for all of us. There were some voices around the space which said the very unpopular thing, violence is wrong on any level, right across the board. I don't believe in violence to solve any problem. But I, that day, taught me that if I was black, I would have picked up a gun. One day, uh, Arthur, who was at that stage running our books, came to me and said, we've got to pay tomorrow, and we have, this is what we have, and he showed me, and it was minus. And we have to pay this cost tomorrow. What are we going to do? And I, I didn't know. And I phoned around. There was nothing. And so I said, well, we're just going to have to get them in tomorrow and, uh, and explain to them that sadly we can't pay them. If there's no money, we, we waited. That was philosophy. So there was compassion and understanding and insight into why we have a theatre. We have a theatre because they're actors. We have a theatre kept clean because they're there are people like Kathy and my Lizzie and Alfred. And yes, and so we've got to serve those people. And so I came in the following morning early and, and, and went to Arthur and said, are they coming in? He said, no, he said, fantastic. I found somebody who's paid, you know, who gave me a, a donation for this. And, and isn't that fantastic? I said, who? He said, oh, no, no, he, he absolutely insists on, 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 on being anonymous. I said, oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful, Arthur. I uh, just wish I knew it was so I could say thank you. He said, no, nope, he doesn't want anybody to know. So they got paid. And uh, a week later, <laughs> a week later I found that Arthur, Oh, God. A week later, I found that Arthur had taken out half of his life savings and paid the salaries. And when I found that out, I thought, that's it. I mean, these extraordinary people. We can't keep doing this. And so we closed. Oh, wow. Well. He was depressed. I mean, here is a mother giving birth to a baby, and the baby fails to grow. Fa the baby fails to be what the mother thought he would be. Because I'm sure he had big dreams, O'Brien, when he started that venture. I was a mess. The only thing that saved my life back then was the woman of Crossroads. Crossroads was a big squatter camp on the edge of Cape Town and it had been built by women who followed their husbands who were working illegally in Cape Town. Crossroads, it was a bush, thick bush. So we had to put up our shacks. All these people that uh, had no dumpers. They pulled over our houses, they gave us notices. They will be stopped at stations. They will be stopped as they visit one another in the locations. Such a system of, on the African women is to create hardships. 
they told us that we don't belong to Cape Town. We must go to the Transkei. So we went, we, we were not pleased about that because going to the Transkei, that meant there's separation from you and your husband. Despite the world's press being in attendance, the appalling treatment of the women and their children continued. So a small group decided to tell their own story, illustrating the violence inflicted on them on a daily basis. So we as women, we thought to ourselves, now the whole world must know how we are living in, 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 in South Africa. That is how the play started. And I sat and watched this amazing piece of theatre. It was just extraordinary. It was this huge, epic narrative poem. It was not written as poetry. And they called it a sketch. It had this absolute energy of them. And they sent up their overlords wonderfully. You could actually see they were fantastic actors. <laughs> just amazing. And they created everybody. The women of Crossroads told stories of traveling to live with their husbands and of the government destroying their homes and sending them away. The play was called Impeduso and would tour to theaters throughout South Africa. In the audience that was watching us, we started singing and, 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 and sending a message to why we are staging this play. Their voices were heard, and the women finally won their battle to live near their husbands in Cape Town, creating the township now known as Crossroads. Yeah, because it told the whole world how the women live in, in South Africa. That was our, our purpose. Yeah. Without shooting people, shot throwing stones, exposing the government, the apartheid government. Here with this woman who had chosen to do a piece of theatre from nowhere. The theatre just grew out of the ground. And I, I, I remember thinking, God, if, if the whole bloody world gets blown up, they will do theatre. It doesn't matter about the space. There are people out there who need to tell their story, and they will, no matter what anybody says. No matter what anybody pays or doesn't pay, no matter about subsidy, no matter about anything like that, people need to tell their story. The space finally closed its doors in 1979. It has survived for seven years under the most horrendous political pressures. Did the space change things? Yeah, in small ways. By his going, we had to find our own way. And we did. Here we are, we're still working, you know, we're still working. But we'll always look back on the space as our mother. We've got an opportunity to put our heads together against all the odds. The space gave you that kind of thing that says you can do anything. You can do it. You know, here's a platform, you can do it. Because I'm a writer today, I'm a director today through that space. The space helped me to dissect and understand my role, that my role as a black person is that I had to be strong, I had to fight, I had to keep on talking. It gave me that confidence and the ability to be able to say what was in my heart. I realized how blessed I was to be working in theater, that what I thought was a curse was in fact a blessing, that you could reach out from that stage and touch another human being and make him think. Dialogue is a way to get out of the bloody mess we are in, because it was eventually dialogue. Nelson Mandela sitting at a table with the ministers of justice and other government officials negotiating his release. That was what created the environment which led eventually to the birth of the new South Africa. I 
the church in the name of they tossed everyone out of the ship in the middle of the sea like a pot of dirty water. It's not so much what we learn as how we learn. And the arts are ways that one um, connects with things. I descend to the end of the sea. The vertical wall. An enormous Theatre has taught me to be Queen Elizabeth and I would play Queen Elizabeth to the best of my ability. I could be doctor, I could be a drug addict, I could be, I could be anything in theater. You are like a chameleon, you change. It gives you that leeway. It's beautiful because you know what? You are learning about mankind. You are going to be involved in the po different politics of the different writers from different countries around the world. You travel the world through the work you do. It's more like a, a language, an inner voice. It helps me express what I feel, not what I think, because it's in, it, I'm unable to express it in general language. Our government has decided to take all the arts out of schools. If there is a school that is doing arts, the arts, it's a school, it's a white school somewhere out there in Belva, or it's a private school that has all the facilities. Our education system is not fair. Yeah. It's like we are asked to, to climb a, a tree, and some of us are fishes, we live in the water. There was a play that actually changed South Africa. Well, in the apartheid struggle, there was a play called The Island, and yeah. it was based on prisoners on Robben Island. John yeah. Gunny was one of the yeah. actors in the original play. And that play toured around the world, and it actually led to sanctions that were placed on South Africa, which were one of the things that led to the helping yes. of ending of apartheid. So it does have power. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. It's time we speak to the people again. It's time we raise the level of consciousness and ask pertinent questions. The artist's job is to keep a very beady eye on the people in power. It doesn't matter if you agree with them or disagree with them. You've got to keep an eye on them because power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. You know, it's an inflexible law of the universe. That theatre must continue. That vigilance is always needed. The pen is, is mightier than the sword.